Hi, thank you. I just want to express a word of personal pleasure standing in front of this uh, sizable crowd. Uh, I can remember a time, probably around seven years ago, when the entire Federalist Society fit into my office at the Yale Law School and didn't use all the chairs. Uh, and it certainly, and I can also remember a time when at the first national meeting of the Federalist Society, also held at the Yale Law School, my, my office was too small, which was great pleasure, but that the dean of the law school, notwithstanding the absolute lack of any scheduling conflict, declined an invitation to ha give us welcoming remarks. I'm pleased that we have on our panel today a former dean of the Yale Law School uh, to make up for that. Uh, this panel uh, is, is going to deal with a, a narrow technical legal issue, uh, namely what is the meaning of the words the executive power as used uh, in, the constitu in the Constitution? Is the microphone working? Oh, good. Uh, then why weren't you laughing? Uh, in any event, I think we have a, a panel here uh, 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 adequate to deal with that technical, narrow legal question. Uh, our first speaker is Charles Cooper. Uh, he attended the University of Alabama and then the University of Alabama Law School, after which he clerked for Judge Paul Roney on the Fifth Circuit and then Justice Rehnquist. After practicing in Atlanta, uh, he came to the Department of Justice where he had been, was a special assistant to the Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division, then Deputy Assistant Attorney General in that division, uh, and now Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Judge Winter. I guess, though, that they weren't laughing because they think that the topic of today's panel is indeed a very narrow, nice, discreet legal issue. Uh, but whether it is that or otherwise, it is certainly a timely one. As uh, Richard Pearl mentioned last night, the President and Congress are currently engaged in a number of disputes over their respective powers in the field of foreign affairs. The use of American naval vessels to escort reflagged merchant ships and the Persian Gulf has once again raised questions concerning the War Powers Act, which have been examined previously, I understand, as well as questions regarding the boundaries uh, between the uh, President's powers as Commander-in-Chief and the Congress's power to declare war. Less dramatically, but no less importantly, uh, Congress has, in the pending Department of State Authorization Bill, asserted a right to use its appropriations power to micromanage the foreign policy of the United States. Similarly, Congress has in the Department of Defense Authorization Bill again invoked the appropriations power to control the President's implementation of a treaty that the Senate consented to 15 years ago. I understand that also has been the subject of deliberations here. And the imminent publication of the Iran-Contra Committee's report will remind us uh, once again that our brief respite from that matter has been all too temporary. Uh, clearly the issue of presidential versus congressional power in the field of foreign affairs is very much with us. But today uh, I would uh, propose to discuss uh, current, not current events, uh, but to examine this issue from an originalist standpoint. That is to examine the framers original understanding of the executive power as it relates to foreign affairs. Let's begin not with the framers themselves, but with their teachers. John Locke's second treatise on civil government was among the framers of primary primers on political science. Locke divided the power of government into three primary parts. The legislative, uh, the power to prescribe the internal or municipal laws of the society. The executive, which was the power to enforce the municipal laws, and the federative, by which Locke meant the power to deal with foreign states. Locke's executive was not a mere functionary carrying out the legislator's wishes. Rather, the holder of executive power possessed, according to Locke, a right to make use of it for the good of society. Many things there are which the law can by no means provide for. 
and those must necessarily be left to the discretion of him that has the executive power in his hands, to be ordered by him as the public good and advantage shall require. In some cases, he continued, it is fit the laws themselves should give way to the executive power. Now, although he viewed the executive and federative powers as distinct, uh, Locke believed that they are not to be separated and placed in the same hands, separated and placed in the hands of distinct persons, excuse me. Locke defined the federative power as the power of war and peace, leagues and alliances, and all the transactions with all persons and communities without the commonwealth. Locke thus envisioned a system of government in which the executive had broad discretionary powers, particularly in foreign affairs. The framers were similarly influenced by the writing, writings of Blackstone and Montesquieu, who also saw the direction of foreign relations as within the executive power. The theories of Locke, Blackstone, and Montesquieu did much to define what the framers understood by executive power. But the way the framers felt about executive power was shaped by their experiences. By the time the Declaration of Independence, uh, Americans, having suffered the oppressions of King George III and his royal governors, had grown suspicious of executive power and placed their confidence in legislative assemblies. Accordingly, the first state constitutions drafted after independence generally featured strong legislatures and very weak executives. For example, the Virginia Constitution of 1776 stated that chief executive shall, with the advice of a council of state, exercise the executive powers of government according to the laws of this commonwealth, and shall not, under any pretense, exercise any power or prerogative by virtue of any law, statute, or custom of England. A similar situation obtained in Pennsylvania, whose constitution of 1776 provided for a virtually omnipotent unicameral legislature and a virtually impotent executive council. There were, uh, to be sure, states that resisted this trend. Uh, the New York Constitution of 1777 and the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, about which more uh, in a moment, both provided for strong executives, but these were uh, distinct exceptions. As Madison stated during the Philadelphia Convention, experience has proved a tendency in our governments to throw all power into the legislative vortex. The executives of the states are in general little more than ciphers, the legislature's omnipotent. In no effective check, if no effective check be devised for restraining the instability and encroachment of the latter, a revolution of some kind or other would be inevitable. Now, if you turn from the states to the national government under the Articles of Confederation, the situation was even worse. The Articles of Confederation established no executive authority at all. Uh, throughout the revolution, executive power was exercised by Congress through a series of ad hoc committees and boards. Such an arrangement was hardly conducive to the conduct of the war, uh, leading General Washington to complain, with some understatement, that there is a vital and inherent principle of delay incompatible with military service in transacting business through such numerous and different channels. And Hamilton noted, the want of an executive was one of the primary deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation. Congress, he said, has kept the power too much in their own hands and have meddled too much with details of every sort. Congress is, properly, a deliberative corps, and it forgets itself when it attempts to play the executive. It is impossible that such a body, numerous as it is and constantly fluctuating, can ever act with sufficient decision or with system. So by the time the uh, Constitutional Convention met in 1787, the pendulum of opinion had swung uh, in a prevailing way in favor of a strong executive. This view was expressed in the Constitution, which created a unitary executive unburdened by an executive council. The president was to be elected by an electoral college, uh, selected by the people, and was neither responsible to nor removable by the legislature, uh, except in so far as he should be guilty of an impeachable offense, of course. The president was given broad powers of appointment, the power to receive foreign ambassadors, the preeminent role in treaty making, 
command of the military, and a qualified veto over legislative action. In short, the executive that emerged uh, from the Philadelphia Convention was an independent repository of government power, subject, of course, uh, to checks, but possessed nonetheless of full dignity and authority in his own right. The extent of the President's power in the field of foreign affairs was very soon put to a test. England and France declared war on each other in 1793, and a problem was immediately presented for the United States because of treaty obligations to France under the 1778 Treaty of Friendship. The treaty had, of course, been enacted, uh, had been entered uh, with the King of, uh, of France prior to the French Revolution, and there was some question whether the treaty continued in force under the new government. A further question arose, however, as to whether the President or the Congress was authorized to make that determination. After consulting with his cabinet, President Washington decided to issue, uh, on his own authority and without any congressional approval, a neutrality proclamation. He was supported in this by Secretary of the Treasury Hamilton, uh, who defended the Constitution, constitutionality of the proclamation in a series of essays published under the pseudonym Pacificus. Hamilton's principal argument was based on the twin conclusions that the proclamation was properly understood as an, an executive act and that all executive authority of the federal government belongs to the president. Now that first proposition is uh, debatable among reasonable men. It seems to me that the second, one is, the second proposition is pretty clear in it, at least uh, if the first sentence of Article II is to be taken seriously. The recitation of specific presidential powers in the remainder of Article II, Hamilton argued, uh, was merely illustrative of the executive power rather than an exhausted, exhaustive catalog of it. Hamilton acknowledged that the executive power was subject to some exceptions as well as limitations. These included the Senate's right to consent to treaties as well as to the appointment of ambassadors and the Congress's power to declare war. But, he argued, as the participation of the Senate in the making of treaties and the power of the legislature to declare war are exceptions out of the general executive power vested in the president, they are to be construed strictly and ought to be extended no further than is essential to their execution. And since neither of those two powers, strictly construed, were implicated by the neutrality proclamation, its issuance was within the executive power of the president. Now, Jefferson had opposed the neutrality proclamation in the cabinet. He believed that the unilateral action of this kind by the president was unconstitutional. Uh, he stated that a declaration of neutrality was a declaration that there should be no war, to which the executive was not competent. And Jefferson was particularly uh, agitated by Hamilton's Pacificus essays, and he urged Madison, his friend and co colleague, to prepare a response. For God's sakes, uh, Jefferson wrote to his friend, take up your pen, select the most striking heresies, and cut him to pieces in the face of the public. There is, no, there is nobody else who can and will enter the lists with him. No, Madison uh, was reluctant, but he complied. Uh, and he prepared a series of essays published under the pseudonym Helvidius. In his essays, Madison denounced uh, Hamilton's notion of executive power as having been inspired by the royal prerogatives of the British uh, government and therefore to be condemned as no less vicious in theory than it would be dangerous in practice. Madison concluded that the power to declare neutrality was a legislative power vested in Congress and not an executive power uh, granted to the president. Now, we don't know for sure why uh, Madison was so reluctant uh, to respond to Hamilton's Pacific essay, but it may well have been because Hamilton's views of executive power mirrored those uh, previously expressed by both Jefferson and Madison. Now, Hamilton's notion that the executive power of Article II, uh, Section 1, was an independent grant of uh, authority above and beyond the specific powers uh, listed in Section 2, was a reiteration of an argument used by Madison in the debate over the removal of power during the first Congress. And Jefferson, in an opinion to President Washington dated April 1790, had written that the Constitution 
has declared that the executive power shall be vested in the president, submitting only special articles of it to a negative by the Senate. The transaction of business with foreign nations is executive altogether. It belongs then to the head of that department, except as such portions of it as are specifically uh, submitted to the Senate, exceptions are to be strictly construed. So his view, uh, at least at that time, was very similar to Hamilton's. An aspect of the president's executive power that is of obvious importance in the field of foreign affairs is the power of the commander in chief. Now, modern theorists are very reluctant to give uh, that power the uh, scope that its uh, wording seems necessary to, to imply, uh, making one wish for a further elaboration within the Constitution. The authors of the Massachusetts Constitution of, of, of 1780 uh, perhaps uh, better predicted uh, uh, those modern theorists because they did elaborate considerably. Article 7 of that Constitution provided that the governor of this commonwealth shall be the commander in chief of the army and navy and of all the military forces of the state by sea and land and shall have full power by himself or by any commander or other officer or officers to train, instruct, exercise, and govern the militia and navy. And for the special defense of the safety of the commonwealth to assemble in martial array and put in a warlike posture the inhabitants thereof and to lead and conduct them and with them to encounter, repel, resist, expel, pursue by force of arms as well by sea as by land with or without the limits of this commonwealth, and also to kill, slay, and destroy, if necessary, and conquer by all fitting ways, enterprises, and means whatsoever, all and every such person, and persons as shall at any time hereafter, in a hostile manner, attempt or enterprise, the destruction, invasion, detriment, or annoyance of the commonwealth, and to take in surprise <laughs> by all ways and means whatsoever, all and every such person or persons with their ships, arms, ammunition, and other goods as shall in a hostile manner invade or attempt the invading, conquering, or annoying this commonwealth. <laughs> and that the governor be entrusted with all these and other powers incident to the offices of captain general, commander in chief, and admiral. Those guys knew how to write a constitution. Now, put in simpler terms, the governor, as commander-in-chief, was authorized to use military force to protect and defend the Commonwealth. Every president of the United States has interpreted his power as commander-in-chief in just the same way. Uh, my time is limited, but let me conclude by illustrating, it's, it's up, I'm told by, <laughs> I'm corrected by the judge, <laughs> though he is without a red light. Uh, so let me very, very briefly uh, outline uh, an illustration from early in our history, Jefferson's experience with the Barbary pirates. I might add parenthetically that any resemblance between this episode and current events in the Persian Gulf is entirely intentional. During the late 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, century, uh, piracy was the major economic activity of the four Barbary states. Merchant ships sailing the Mediterranean were often attacked by pirates who would not only steal their cargoes, uh, but would kidnap their crews for ransom. In addition to these uh, income-producing activities, the Barbary states also accepted bribes for not conducting those pursuits, kind of a sovereign uh, protection racket. In May 1801, Tripoli declared war on the United States. It was upset because the United States wasn't paying the kind of bribes we were, to them that we were paying elsewhere. Uh, but before word of the declaration of war arrived in Washington, the Secretary of the Navy dispatched a squadron of four vessels under the command of Commodore Richard Dale to the Mediterranean on an observation cruise. His orders were to sail uh, to the Mediterranean and inform those Barbary states that the attitude of the American government was perfectly friendly but that we intended to protect American commerce from attack. Dale was also instructed that if he should find any or all of the Barbary states had declared war on America, he was to chastise their insolence by sinking, burning, or destroying their ships wherever he shall find them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Commodore Dale ordered that the four ships fly only the English flag while at sea until such time as there was a necessary necessity for the contrary. One of the ships in the squadron, the schooner Enterprise, encountered a Tripolitan uh, cruiser in the Mediterranean. The pirate commander was completely fooled by the English flag and somewhat indiscreetly confided to the American captain that he was in search of American uh, merchant ships. Upon hearing that, the Enterprise lowered the English flag and raised the American flag. <laughs> this, I think, was America's first reflagging operation. <laughs> the Americans then opened fire and severely uh, uh, defeated the opponent. The significant point about this episode is that the President Jefferson, without consulting, much less obtaining the approval of Congress, sent American military forces halfway around the world with explicit orders to engage in hostilities if necessary. Not only did Jefferson take this initiative on his own authority, he did not report it to Congress until six months later. Um, in conclusion, uh, I submit that uh, the way that the presidents of, of our country have handled foreign affairs is precisely as the framers intended them to. Thank you very much. I would have stopped him earlier, but he frightened me with all that stuff. <laughs> our next speaker is Professor Michael Tiger. Uh, he attended Bolt Hall at Berkeley, where he was editor-in-chief of the University of California Law Review. He then practiced law at Tiger Buffon and Williams uh, and Conley. Um, Professor uh, uh, Tiger is now <coughs> at the University of uh, Texas Law School, uh, a, a statement I would not have to make were it not for the fact that you can't see his cowboy boots, uh, w which are magnificent. I, Hope to have him parade up in front here after he's done talking. Um, uh, and he presently holds the Joseph C. Jamal Chair uh, in Law. Professor Tiger. Nearly 20 years ago, I wrote an article entitled Judicial Power, the Political Question Doctrine and Foreign Relations. I wrote in the shadow of significant military activity in Vietnam and the incursion into Cambodia. And I asked what, if any, role the Constitution required or permitted the federal judiciary to play in finding, declaring, and enforcing the rules of domestic and international law that limit military action by the executive branch. Well, today we live in the shadow of other conflict and must again measure the roles of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches in foreign and military affairs. Since I wrote, presidents of both parties have claimed the unreviewable power to take action that the Constitution seems to forbid, and to justify that action by invoking a vaguely defined concern for national security and a theory that the courts ought to keep their hands off. President Nixon sought to justify warrantless domestic electronic surveillance. President Carter made a more extensive claim in the context of alleged espionage, and the Reagan administration has taken the argument several steps further and claims a broad immunity from both congressional and judicial scrutiny of its actions. Now, in the few minutes available to me, I want to ask three questions. First, what role does the Constitution assign to the judiciary in the conduct of foreign and military affairs? Second, what are the sources of law the judiciary might apply in its sphere of competence? And third, what are the implications of these conclusions in today's international situation? I'm not going to repeat the 1970 article. I've copy of it is attached to my prepared remarks. The theme was simple, that the political question doctrine is all too often a judicial code word for avoiding a judicial duty to protect litigants from unlawful exercises of executive power. In Marbury versus Madison, as been mentioned here today, Chief Justice Marshall acknowledged that some executive acts are beyond judicial review. Since that dictum was pronounced, presidents and judges have tussled about what it means. But in the United States against Burr, Chief Justice Marshall left no doubt that the President was not immune from judicial process, a decision that formed the cornerstone of Dean Wigmore's treatment of executive privilege. Now, Harry Truman thought that he could seize the steel industry 
and run it during the Korean conflict because he was president and there was shooting in Asia. The Supreme Court, led by Justice Tom Clark, had no trouble spelling out some truths about constitutional governance. First, presidents must obey the law. Second, in our society, the laws are not silent in times of war. And third, the judiciary has the power to declare the law when a real case or controversy requires such a declaration in order to decide who wins and who loses. A majority of the D.C. Circuit sitting in bank echoed these principles when an American citizen sued because the United States government had taken over his land in Honduras to help mount covert military operations in Central America. These cases reflect a proper judicial attitude towards executive claims of unreviewable power to conduct foreign and military policy. After all, some who opposed the adoption of the Constitution did so because the executive branch appeared to possess too much unfettered power. Patrick Henry wondered in the Virginia debates whether a lawless president would really obey the Supreme Court or whether he would use his power as commander-in-chief to defy it. Henry's concern, whether we agree with it or not, expresses a contemporaneous understanding, call it original intent if you must, that the judicial branch was to have a major role in seeing that the laws were faithfully executed. Of course, the Congress was also empowered to restrain foreign military activity through the control of appropriations, declaration of war, and grant of letters of mark and reprisal. Most people here today know that then-Congressman Abraham Lincoln inveighed against the idea that a president could make himself like a king, involving and impoverishing the people in war. In addition, the Senate's power of concurrence in treaties was to give it a role in shaping foreign policy, although sadly some are arguing that the Senate can today consent to a treaty without understanding what the executive branch thinks it means. So while the President may embark upon a course of foreign policy or step down the road of foreign military adventure, when that conduct infringes a private right, the judiciary will presumptively have power to fashion some remedy. The opposition to this view, as expressed, for example, by the dissenters in the D.C. Circuit, is based upon both factual and legal solecisms. That case did not involve a presidential decision to respond to a sudden attack, so hypotheticals conjured out of such imaginings exalt drama over common sense. The dissenters went on to question why non-elected judges should be telling an elected president that he was trampling private rights in his march towards a military objective. The answer is plain in the Constitution's text and in the law life of the nation. The text recognizes that war is so calamitous an event for both public and private interests that the president alone is not supposed to propel us into one. Justice Story said as much in his authoritative commentaries on the Constitution. Our national experience demonstrates that the rush towards improvident armed conflict is often associated with jingoistic rhetoric systematic assaults on the rights of dissent, and a public atmosphere of intolerance. Non-elected judges are supposed to restrain such things in the service of counter-majoritarian values built into the Constitution by the framers. Now, what do I mean by law in this context? Article 6 of the Constitution makes supreme the Constitution, laws, and treaties. I'm sorry to have to say something that sounds tautological, but the point appears to have been lost in recent days. Military activity in violation of laws of the United States is unlawful. I am not talking only about the so-called Boland Amendment, but also about the network of laws that limit the use of United States funds, territory, and personnel to conduct hostile action against countries with whom we are at peace. Nothing in the text, history, or authoritative interpretation of the Constitution gives a president a shred of justification for violating or purporting to authorize violation of such laws. To argue the contrary is to sunder the most basic understanding upon which the Constitution was ratified, namely, that the states, parties to this compact, were not installing as head of state a king by some other name, and certainly not a king who was free to ignore a dictum as old as Lord Cook's statement of the principle in Lord Bonham's case that there is a law that binds sovereign and citizen indifferently. A military activity undertaken without affirmative congressional approval may also be unlawful depending on one's interpretation of the Constitution. I've defended the view that all presidential military activity other than repelling a sudden attack requires a congressional declaration, at least if the activity involves what are, under international law, acts of war. Treaties such as the United Nations Charter also play a part in limiting executive power. But there's another source of law, long recognized, 
When the Spanish-American War broke out, the American Navy put a blockade around Cuba, and one of the first things they did was to seize two Cuban fishing vessels returning from their business. They had them forfeited as prizes of war. The Supreme Court reversed in a case called the Paquete Havana, finding that laws under the Supremacy Clause include the rules of customary international law that exempt such vessels from seizure as prizes, and the Navy was ordered to restore the proceeds and pay damages to the owners. So the idea that international law is a part of the Supremacy Clause is far from being a new one. And since that decision in 1900, international law has undergone enormous change. Its content has grown to embrace new rights of persons, entities, and nations. Most courts have agreed that individuals as such are beneficiaries of international law. Some judges, such as Judge Bork, concurring in Tel Oren against Libyan Aaron Republic, have doubted the extent of this principle, but his views are, in my opinion, inconsistent with a growing international consensus. In some, presidents and their agents are subject to the commands of customary international law that limit such things as violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity and interference with internal affairs. Now, my summary of the sources of law is quite independent <coughs> of my earlier discussion of the proper role of the judiciary. Even if one believes that judges should not interfere with particular kinds of executive decision, the rules of law are still there, and a president's obedience to them is at least a function of his or her oath of office. Let me make no mistake about my meaning. I tremble for my country when I see its president proclaim that he and his staff are not bound by congressional restrictions on how appropriated funds are spent when Article I of the Constitution gives Congress the power over the public monies. Everyone who takes the Supremacy Clause seriously must insist that the President not be able to pick and choose which part of the Constitution, which laws and which treaties he will obey. The International Court of Justice took jurisdiction in United States versus Nicaragua, and after the United States default, fulfilled its duty by investigating the facts and rendering an opinion by a lopsided majority that the United States was violating international law. The President and his advisors first derided, then ignored the Court's decision a defiance that sets them against the Supremacy Clause and weakens an already fragile, though decisively important, participant in the quest for peace and freedom in the international community. More years ago than I care to remember, I studied with the French conservative political theorist Bertrand Juvenel. I was eager to judge political decisions of the past and present as right or wrong by my sometimes dim but always unwavering lights. President, Professor de Juvenel, rather, reminded me that the most enduring lesson of great controversies, such as Truman's steel seizure and the commitment of troops to Korea, was that in our passion to see a decision made in a particular way, we too quickly forget our most cherished convictions as to who is competent to take it. Now as then, that is the first lesson. Whether we agree or disagree with the policies of a particular president, we cannot blind ourselves to the duties of the legislative and judicial branches to play their important part. A corollary principle is that the political question doctrine invoked at times as a barrier to deciding the legality of foreign and military affairs decision that touch on private rights is unprincipled and illegitimate. Those who say they like the doctrine laud it because of its, quote, flexibility, although they concede its, quote, uncertainty. For me, this flexibility and uncertainty translates in practice into an unfettered judicial discretion to duck the duties and surrender the powers that Article Three clearly confers. The second and final lesson is this. In the criminal law of Texas, if you have suffered an indignity or endured a threat, you can go home, stew about it for a while, return to the scene hours or days or weeks later, blow away your antagonist and still have a good defense to a murder charge. In the 19th century, it was sort of like that for the big powers. If Billy Hurst and Teddy Roosevelt thought we should go down there and avenge some insult and grab some territory and further our theory of government, well, that was the way it was. But in the world, as in Texas, we are all, to my regret at times, living a little closer together these days, and the armament is a little more powerful. And in the wake of World War II, the dozens of newly independent nation states assert their rights to develop along their own lines. The principles of international law are coming to dictate what common sense should have told us. The new age requires more and not, not less restraint in foreign and military policy. It requires more and not less attention to the principles of domestic and international law that the Constitution makes the supreme law of the land. That is why we must pay renewed attention to the law and its enforcement. And that is why the Reagan administration has failed America.
Uh, much to my relief, uh, Senator Hatch has arrived and Mr. Cooper has returned. But, uh, when Mr. Cooper got up to leave, uh, I became rather apprehensive. I'd been on panels in which the uh, audience slowly disappeared, but <laughs> never on one in which the audience stayed while the panel disappeared. Uh, our next speaker, I, I could literally take uh, virtually the entire afternoon uh, recounting his career. Uh, Gene Rostow uh, went to Yale in the Yale Law School. He was the editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal. Uh, he served in uh, various posts uh, during and after World War II dealing with foreign affairs. He was for 10 years the dean of the Yale Law School. Uh, he was the under, has been the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the Johnson Administration, Director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in the Reagan Administration. Uh, he w was Sterling Professor of Law and Public Affairs at Yale, the highest chair one could hold in the law school. Uh, he now holds that emeritus and is the Visiting Research Professor of Law and Diplomacy at the National Defense University. Uh, I will spare you reading Gene's bibliography. Uh, that would take too long other than to say he's, he's written uh, on antitrust law, uh, a most famous article uh, uh, on the detention of Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, he's written books on economic policy and uh, foreign affairs. Gene Rostow. Uh, Judge Winter, I ask for an extra seven minutes to answer some of the uh, solecisms of Professor Tiger. Hmm? <laughs> uh, let me start uh, this um, uh, brief talk by <clears throat> uh, recalling what I regard as the most important and most profound uh, sentence that John Marshall ever wrote. Let us never forget, he said in McCulloch against Maryland, that it's a constitution we're expounding. By that, I think he meant three things at least. <clears throat> First, and he's, he came to this theme often, that the constitution is not a prolix code, as he called it, but a short, clear, general outline, and he used the word outline, of the structure and principles of government, an outline every citizen could understand. That was a bit of optimism, I guess, but still. In, in broad terms, I think it remains true. He thought that the, that quality of the Constitution was infinitely valuable as a resource for a society of free men and women. It was also a most appropriate starting place for the evolution of a body of law. Secondly, his uh, remark left ample room for growth and adaptation uh, as the general principles of the Constitution and its broad language uh, were applied to the necessities of governance in a constantly changing world. And the third uh, implication, I think, of uh, Marshall's sentence is that the Constitution demanded constitution, uh, co continuity as well as, the, as flexibility and the, and the capacity to adapt to change. Continuity in values, at least, if not in detail. Marshall's jurisprudence was far too sophisticated to exaggerate the role of original intent among the forces which govern the growth of the law. Article two is an excellent uh, area in which to examine the implications of Marshall's thesis. Uh, we've heard uh, Secretary Weinberger yesterday and uh, uh, General Cooper today uh, pointing out that the presidency is one of the principal creations of the Founding Fathers, a carefully considered response to the inadequacies of government, uh, the government of the United States under the Continental Congress and then the Articles of Confederation. Uh, a strong executive certainly was, as they've told us, a felt necessity uh, at the time of the convention. Uh, an executive, Hamilton said, capable of energy, secrecy, and dispatch. The president was not to be elected by the Congress, but by the people uh, through the Electoral College, uh, 
and in many of the most important aspects of his duty, uh, in Marshall's words in, in uh, an early case, uh, he was not and is not responsible to Congress, but responsible only to the country in his political capacity and to his own conscience. It's a very striking sentence and an extremely important one in uh, attempting to recognize and uh, delineate the prerogatives of the presidency, which are among his most important uh, powers. He possesses, uh, according to this view, Marshall's view, part of the wafer of so sovereignty, and in many respects, he is not responsible to Congress at all. Of course, this prescription is under very severe attack these days, uh, as Congress uh, continues its relentless drive since Vietnam for omnipotence. <clears throat> but I submit that the President's prerogatives will survive and indeed prevail if the Presidents fight for them because they correspond to the nature of things and the necessities of government in the United States. And the nature of things, uh, in Montesquieu's famous first sentence, first sentence of his Spirit of the Laws, uh, was the source, uh, the nature of things is the source of the law of societies as it is the source of the laws of the physical universe. Now what was this executive power vested in the President by Article Two? General Cooper has read you the, some passages from Locke and there are other passages. Uh, of the same nature which can be uh, brought forward and they're very germane to our problem. Hamilton said uh, that the executive power was all governmental power which is not judicial or legislative in character. An odd but relatively useful definition even though it's not fully adequate. In many instances, for example, the president may, must act, may act and must act even though Congress may also act, but has not yet done so. Now, the case that uh, Mr. Cooper uh, referred to of the issuance of a, uh, of a neutrality proclamation by President Washington is a good example. He issued the proclamation. The Congress uh, did not do so, although later it had to pass a neutrality act, which is, by the way, is still on the books in large part. Sometimes, however, even where Congress has acted, a change in circumstance may justify a president in acting independently. Yesterday afternoon, uh, an episode was discussed. I don't know the, whether the facts are correct, but let's assume they are, of President Franklin Roosevelt informing the British of the whereabouts of the Bismarck during the war and at a time when we were not in the war, but we're still neutral. The question was put uh, to the speaker at the time as to whether uh, that action by President Roosevelt was legal. And the answer was, and it was apparently assumed that it was illegal, but a good, good thing anyway. Well, I, uh, I submit that on an episode of that kind, which is very important to consider, uh, the um, pro legal problem is far more complex than the brief discussion yesterday uh, indicated. Uh, John Locke spoke to it uh, in one of his passages, indicating that under exceptional circumstances, the executive could indeed uh, ignore a statute in, uh, in the exercise of his, of his uh, inherent powers. And so did the Supreme Court in the uh, important case of Mississippi, as, of uh, Mississippi against Andrew Johnson. Let me start, however, with Hamilton's proposition. Under international law, the United States has all the powers of sovereignty that all other states possess, including the sovereign power to disobey and violate international law and take the international consequences. The Constitution divides those powers between the President and Congress on the principle, I think, of functional necessity. Uh, the legislative, uh, all the executive power of the United States goes to the president, subject to some exceptions in the Constitution, and all the national legislative powers of the United States go to Congress, subject also to some exceptions. As Madison said, the principle of the separation of powers does not really call for separation, but for intermingling and interdependence. <clears throat> 
The executive power, according to Montesquieu, had two great categories. The executive in respect to things dependent on the law of nations, and the executive in regard to matters that depend on the civil law. But the essential fact about this uh, division is that it cannot survive, as Professor uh, Corwin wrote, unless each department can defend its characteristic functions against intrusion by either of the others. And that is our principal, one, one of our principal constitutional problems today. Because as Madison warned uh, in the Federalist Papers, the framers were so preoccupied with the risks of executive tyranny that they seem never to have recalled the danger from legislative usurpations uh, which can lead to the same kind of tyranny threatened by legislative usurpations. I stand largely in characterizing the presidency with uh, uh, Corwin's uh, conclusion after reviewing this early history and the, the writings of the teachers of the framers, uh, which he puts this way. The fact is that what the framers had in mind was not the cabinet system, as yet non-existent even in Great Britain, but the balanced constitution of Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone, which carried with it the idea of a divided initiative in the matter of legislation and a broad range of autonomous executive power or prerogative. Sir Henry Maine's dictum that the American Constitution is the British Constitution with the monarchy left out is, from the point of view of 1789, almost the exact reverse of the truth for the presidency was designed in great measure to reproduce the monarchy of George III with the corruption left out and also, of course, the hereditary feature. <laughs> uh, well, I, don't, I think all those uh, uh, comparisons between the parliamentary system and the presidential system fail uh, for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, the fact that the president was intended to be a strong independent office and that he had a vaguely defined prerogative power carried over from the uh, British Constitution, I think is unanswerable. Uh, now, of, of course, those exceptions that I referred to before in the allocation of legislative and, and, uh, uh, and uh, executive authority are very important and they've been mentioned. That is the participation of the Senate in the appointment of officers and the ratification of treaties and the power uh, of Congress to declare war. Now, the language of those two paragraphs of Article I, Section 8, dealing with the war, where the war power appears, are all um, uh, are all uh, concerned with matters of international law. The, um, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, and to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. These are all matters of international law, and the meaning of those words is their international law meaning. Now, uh, and of course, it should be remarked that the Founding Fathers were far more familiar uh, with international law because of the way they were trained than most lawyers are nowadays. Now, I submit, I said recently in an article, that with the possible exception of the provision of the Constitution requiring two senators from each state now, these two paragraphs are among the least ambiguous paragraphs in the Constitution. The declaring war provision uh, does not mean at all what Professor Tiger uh, said it meant. It did not give a vast uh, supreme power over war in Congress, subject to the narrow exception for immediate defense. It vested in the president the power to decide when to use the national force except in all, in all cases, except those rare ones when, when it was decided to be politically sound to declare general war. The distinction between limited war and general war is a distinction in international law, which legitimizes the use of force uh, 
during peacetime in a limited way in order to eliminate violations of international law of a violent character which uh, interfere with the rights of states. And uh, Hamilton, and uh, in principle Jefferson as well, remarks that uh, uh, Mr. Cooper quoted here, uh, treated this, the power of Congress to declare war as an exception to the general rule, which was that instituting use, the use of the national force was a matter uh, for the president to initiate. Now it's uh, not, of course, at all clear cut in uh, the sense because presidents prudently have obtained congressional support for their use of the national force uh, when they could, as they could, uh, very often whenever the international use of force required an extended or a particularly bitter and divisive um, uh, campaign. But the, uh, the uh, division of the of power uh, that's been claimed by many people, especially at the political level, uh, is, um, a, I think, perfectly clear cut from the beginning, certainly in the exchange between Hamilton and Madison to which Mr. Cooper referred, and it's true anyway in the pattern of our history ever since. The clearest demonstration of it, I think, is uh, revealed in the history of the War Powers Declaration. The draftsmen uh, uh, of the War Powers Declaration started out bravely with the premise of congressional supremacy, that the president couldn't use the national force except to repel sudden attacks without the prior consent of Congress. But they wound up, after examining our constitutional history and the facts of life, uh, with the uh, statute which we now have, which recognizes uh, that the president uh, has, according to them, a discretion to use the national force at his uh, will uh, for at least 90 days. Now, of course, the statute is uh, unconstitutional in my opinion, uh, profoundly unconstitutional, not simply because it violates the principle of the Chatter case, which it does, as uh, Secretary Weinberger pointed out to us yesterday, uh, but for much deeper reasons of, of the separation of powers as well. Uh, for example, uh, many people say, ah, oh, well, the requirement of reporting is an innocent sort of requirement, and we want uh, freedom of information, and we all ought to have a right to know, and so on. And uh, surely that's constitutional. Well, in many ways, uh, things happen which the president shouldn't report to Congress or indeed to anyone else. Uh, we heard uh, Judge Webster at lunch uh, talking about the provisions for obtaining some uh, congressional surveillance over intelligence activities, and uh, that's not reporting to Congress at all. That's reporting, uh, whether it's constitutional or not, uh, to uh, a small number, the gang of eight, as he said or even fewer uh, members of Congress. But there are lots of things the president shouldn't report. Perhaps the most important event in President, president Nixon's uh, presidency uh, was the nuclear warning which he issued to the Soviet Union uh, to prevent a nuclear attack by the Soviet Union against China. Uh, president uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, also uh, issued nuclear threats to the Soviet Union to keep them out of the Middle Eastern War, and of course Truman did uh, in Korea. Now, there was absolutely no point, not only no point, it would have been uh, impossible for such a nuclear threat or hint to have carried out its function uh, if, um, uh, if uh, the fact had to be disclosed at the time or even later. And everybody in, in drafting the uh, War Powers Resolution, all participants in the, uh, in the testimony agreed that, of course, the nuclear weapon had to be left under the sole control of the president, which seems to me to give away the entire issue and to confirm what I've said about the nature of the problem of presidential versus congressional discretion. <laughs>
There's no one else who can possibly control the nuclear weapon, therefore everybody agrees he has to be allowed to use it. Now, the essence of the, the presidential prerogative, uh, which uh, we've been talking about really mainly as part of the executive power, uh, is, was defined best by the practices of President Lincoln. And uh, what I want to, uh, to point out, really, is that uh, there is an immense reservoir of great national powers defined by international law and by the nature of the na nation. Uh, I recall to you a very powerful opinion on this subject by uh, Justice Miller in ex parte Yarborough, one of my favorite cases in, in the Supreme Court and in, uh, in, uh, in fact, I think one of the most neglected opinions in the canon. Rarely find it in a case book. Now the examples that we've talked about of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and of Lincoln, of Truman as well, uh, in, uh, in uh, taking action and using the national force without prior congressional approval or, or so on, I think we must regard uh, not as violations of law at all. They were helping to define the law because law is much more than a chronicle of what the courts say or even what the courts decide. I would submit that the Korematsu case uh, is all, has already been overruled, in fact, although the Supreme Court decided it and it's never been overruled by the Supreme Court. It's been overruled, in fact, because of the criticisms which have been addressed to it, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Professor Tiger for recalling an article I wrote many years ago, which I think is the best article I ever, oh no, it was you, Judge Winter. I think it's the best article I ever wrote. But I don't think any practicing lawyer today would cite that uh, decision of the Supreme Court uh, in a brief. I think it's been overruled in fact, even though the court has not recognized it. Now, I think that is what uh, Marshall meant, that the law is, and not so much what has been said, but a pattern of behavior which the society deems right. That's what his remark in McCulloch against Marshall, uh, Maryland means, that there are great ab uh, abiding purposes and values in the Constitution which do survive and guide, guide us. And they're very simple maxims about being a government of laws and not of men, separation of powers, and so on. Are there limits to the power of the executive branch? Of course there are. I fully agree with Professor Tiger that the courts can and do and should take cases dealing with defining these limits. Uh, covered against Reed is one kind of limit on the executive power. Uh, Korematsu, of course, is another. Uh, we spend a, a good deal too much time, in my judgment, trying to uh, determine exactly how the find, founding fathers would have dealt with the Vietnam War or the nuclear weapon. And it's an impossible exercise and diverts us from more germane things. Madison and Hamilton, as uh, Mr. Cooper pointed out, who knew a great deal more about original intent than we're ever going to know, uh, differed about the ex extent of the war powers and presidential power to dismiss his cabinet officers uh, within a few years of the convention. The great overriding policy goals of the Constitution abide, but constitutional law, like any other law, is a living growth uh, reflecting the wisdom of Holmes' famous phrase, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Once again, fortunate to have him here. Uh, Senator Hatch did his undergraduate work at Brigham Young University and got his law degree from the University of Pittsburgh. He's been a United States Senator from the state of uh, Utah since 1977, and I might say that uh, uh, Senator Hatch uh, uh, probably is the nation's foremost practitioner of constitutional law because the debates over co constitutional matters in the Congress are probably uh, uh, far more important than what goes on uh, really in court, uh, and Senator Hatch has been a historic participant in the, the numerous constitutional debates that seem to occupy the Congress these days. Senator Hatch.
Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with this distinguished uh, panel here today. And thank you, Judge Winter. I uh, really would like to t chat with you about what made me late here today, and that is uh, continuing to fight for Judge Ginsburg, because I think it's pathetic. <laughs> I think it's pathetic what is happening to him. And to be honest with you, I think there's a, there are a certain number of people down there at the White House who have no guts whatsoever, and I'm sick of it. <laughs> Maybe I better stop there, because <laughs> I'm really mad, and I might really say some things I might regret. I doubt it. <laughs> I'm happy to be with you and happy to discuss this matter. As you know, you all know what the Constitution says in Article 1, Section 8, Article 1, Section 9, Article 2, Section 2, with regard to presidential power. It has plenty to say, and vis-a-vis -vis the Congress of the United States. John Jay explains in The Federalist why the President was selected to propose, initiate, and generally take the lead in foreign policy. In foreign affairs, he explains, Perfect secrecy and immediate dispatch are sometimes requisite. There are times where the most useful intelligence may be obtained if the persons possessing it can be relieved from the appreh apprehensions of discovery. There are doubtless many who would rely on the secrecy of the President, but who would not confide in the Senate. I might underscore that by saying I am one of those. That's in Federalist Number 64. Moreover, the Constitution permits the President, via the appointment power, to place delegates in every land. Delegates who do not adjourn or, uh, or for occasional recesses, but are perpetually on duty and ready for action. Thus, the President was placed in the position of leadership for foreign affairs. He negotiates treaties, he receives foreign delegations, he generally proposes and, and uh, shapes uh, all foreign policy. Congress cooperates in this process by reviewing and accepting or rejecting those policies. The reason the pre President is the person designated by the Constitution to head foreign policy is he can act with dispatch. He or she can provide better secrecy. He or she can better ensure consistency in that policy. He or she can better articulate a clear policy. He or she has access to worldwide intelligence via ambassadors. And he or she does not take recesses like Congress. Now, what about reconciling the President's spending clause with the President's foreign powers or foreign policy power? The President is given the power to lead in foreign policy. The Congress is given what I call a checking function, which is in the case of judicial nominations and, of course, uh, the advice and consent power. The checking function, however, must never be allowed to swallow the general foreign policy power of the President. The Constitution contains no explicit pr uh, principle defining the interface between these general grants of authority. Congress has the power of the purse. And the President is, to quote John Marshall when he was a congressman for Virginia, the sole organ of foreign relations. It should be clear, however, that, the con that constitutional foreign policy functions may not be eliminated by a congressional refusal to appropriate funds. The President may not, for example, be, den be denied funding to receive ambassadors, to deliver foreign policy addresses, and to negotiate treaties. Uh, I think you would find that in the U.S. versus Curtis Wright case, which held that the President may carry out a, con a congressional law uh, giving him authority to embargo arms. Now, he makes treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate, but he alone negotiates. Into the field of negotiation, the Senate cannot enter, and that means that, uh, that the President has power to remove obstacles to recognition of other nations. By the same token, it is clear that the President's foreign policy authorities do not compel Congress to appropriate funds exactly as the President desires. Congress is given discretion to appropriate funds as it sees fit, and the President participates in that process by wielding his uh, veto power. Now, in sum, the Constitution does not explicitly articulate a principle governing the degree to which Congress can condition foreign policy appropriations.
because of political questions, standing, and other justi justiciability doctrines, sweeping separation of powers cases have only rarely reached the courts, such as in U.S. Uh, versus Nixon or, Nixon or Youngstown uh, Sheet and Tube or the Curtis Wright case. The closest thing to an attempt to articulate a principle is Justice Jackson's observation in Youngstown in 1952. He said, when the president acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress, his authority is at its maximum, for it includes all that he possesses in his own right, plus all that Congress can, can delegate. When the president takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb, for, when he can rely, for then he can rely only upon his own constitutional powers minus any constitutional powers of Congress over the matter." Unquote. Now this does little more than state the obvious. The Supreme Court simply has not articulated any principle defining Congress suspending power when it collides with the President's own foreign policy prerogatives. Thus it is not necessarily unusual. Many constitutional questions are resolved by a pattern of construction and practice between the two political branches. Although the court is not likely to set limits, there are clearly limits on Congress's ability to force compliance with its appropriations policies. In my opinion, Congress oversteps its role when it undertakes to dictate the specific terms of international relations. This is, an, uh, this is a power granted, specifically, it seems to me, to the executive entity which is equipped to acquire the information necessary for foreign policy creation. Congress's role, again, is to act as a check. To the extent that Congress interjects itself into the process of creating new policies, that is, permitting specific forms of humanitarian aid but not others, et cetera, it is venturing beyond its own, beyond its, uh, own constitutional mission, uh, mission. I'm going to skip my remarks with regard to the military and the analogies that I was going to draw there. What are some of the historical rebuttals to executive power? Some might assert that history tends to give wide breadth to Congress holding po or spending power in relation to the President's foreign policy role. Prior to 1787, the English Parliament used the spending power to wrench control from the king. Moreover, colonial legislatures established a similar superiority in funding questions over the colonial governors. Some have argued that these precedents mean Congress may use the spending clause as a check on fears that the president might, might uh, tend to acquire kingly preeminence. To this line of reasoning, I think the response is direct. The 1787 convention did not adopt a parliamentary system with unquestioned le legislative uh, dominance, but instead adopted a government of three co-equal branches. Under that system of equal branches, the executive received, for reasons mentioned uh, before, the preeminent authority over foreign policy. Unlike parliamentary systems, the legislature does not have an automatic dominance over the other departments of government. To the degree that it attempts to assert such dominance, Congress is misreading the balance of powers envisioned by the Constitution. Many senators argue that the conduct of foreign policy is essentially a concurrent power. Congress has certain foreign policy duties, such as the earmarking of taxpayer dollars, and the President has certain other duties, such as the negotiation of treaties. Thus, foreign affairs is a shared power, and the President cannot flaunt the will of Congress. A reasonable response to that line might be, granted that the Constitution envisions some overlapping of authorities with respect to foreign affairs, this is healthy, it seems to me, because it operates as a check and balance. Furthermore, the requirement of some concurrence between Congress and the executive will ensure that a national consensus forms as the nation is committed to new foreign policy directions. When, however, the Congress presumes to wrench from the President his role as chief articulator and sole organ of foreign policy leadership by dictating conditions in appropriations bills, it has stepped away from its role as a check on how tax dollars are, are or should be spent and has stepped into the role of usurper. In other words, Congress is ignoring its role as a check on the President and assuming a leadership role akin to negotiating a treaty, an activity it seems to me clearly forbidden to Congress when it dictates specific conditions of relations between foreign entities. Well, could we give an example of congressional ineptitude? Well, I think maybe I will. I think I'll cite the Boland Amendment. How's that? 
Now, is it really the Boland Amendment or is it the Boland Amendments? Or would you really let them rise to the dignity of amendments, of definition of amendments? The Boland Amendments may not violate the legal limits of the Constitution, if only because the Constitution appears to set no clear limits. But it is even more certain that they do violate the spirit and general principles of the document. The reasons that the framers committed foreign policy preeminence to the executive becomes even more clear when we trace the course of the Boland Amendments. One year aid is allowed as long, it is not, as, long it, as it is not used by the CIA to overthrow the Sandinistas. The next year aid is permitted as long as DOD and CIA do not engage in a list of specific activities. The next year aid is allowed with few restrictions at all. The next year aid, direct or indirect, is forbidden. The next year aid is permitted again, but only if it is humanitarian. Finally, aid is resumed without conditions. Now this kind of consistency and clarity in foreign policy <laughs> could only come from Congress, do you see? If all of our foreign affairs were conducted in this fashion or manner, we would probably provoke World War III in a short period of time with the entire world fighting us. In the absence of a clear legal demarcation between congressional and executive, executive authority, this constitutional issue will be decided by a lengthy pattern of practice between the branches. Our attempt to find a general principle that ought to govern suggests that the president ought to be left to propose and initiate. Congress ought to be employed as a check on faulty policies. When Congress presumes to lead and set conditions, However, it seems to me it is venturing to undertake a mission it is ill-equipped to handle. We criticize judges for presuming to legislate, a function they are ill-equipped to uh, undertake. I think we'd all agree in this room, or at least I hope so. There may be one or two exceptions. Likewise, Congress, lacking delegates worldwide and the ability to act with secrecy and dispatch, is not equipped to really operate or formulate foreign policy. The Boland Amendments are classic examples of the reasons the framers did not place foreign affairs into the hands of Congress. Now, let me just say this to you. With regard to the War Powers Act, I had a whole raft of things I was going to say, but I think uh, I've taken enough time. Let me just say that the Constitution does not envision that we stop and file a cloture petition in the Senate before returning fire. The Constitution clearly does not envision that we stop and seek a time agreement for the Senate debate before uh, protecting American lives and interests. The Constitution clearly does not envision that we consider a veto override before dodging a torpedo or digging a foxhole. It seems to me those are some of the problems that we have with the war power, and by necessity, having chosen this, that one paragraph of what I was going to say, I have left a whole raft of other things unspoken. I agree with Gene Rostow. It is unconstitutional. And it is uh, something that Congress has, it seems to me, foisted off on presidents uh, politically, even though I don't think it can be upheld constitutionally or judicially. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here with you. Rather, <clears throat> rather than have uh, the various speakers engage in rebuttal, I think I will uh, open the floor to uh, questions. I, I gather from the microphone set up in the aisle that uh, you're supposed to move to a microphone to ask questions, and all of the panelists should feel free to respond where they have a response they believe appropriate. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just uh, I was just wondering if uh, if Mr. Hatch and Mr. Rostow, and I guess to be fair, all four of you, uh, could perhaps explain why Judge Sofair and the State Department, in trying to reinterpret correctly, in my mind, the ABM Treaty, why they haven't really referred to what President Carter did in regard to the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979, where, whereupon he decided that treaty uh, 
uh, was not something he wanted to abide by, I think. If you could discuss that briefly. Senator? Um, oh, Gene? Well, I'll take a, take a crack at it. Uh, it's rare for a, a, a perennial witness to have an opportunity to speaking, of speaking before the senator, so I'll enjoy that for a moment. But he'll have the last word, which I think is the polite thing to do. Um, President Carter's action in, uh, in, uh, uh, in abrogating the uh, security treaty with Taiwan, I objected to at the time, and I object to it still on constitutional grounds. His claim of justification for doing that, I find it very hard to imagine that a treaty uh, ratified with the advice and consent of the Senate and part of the supreme law of the land can be uh, abrogated by a president on his own bat. I mean, if, if a president uh, should suddenly take us out of NATO and we woke up in the morning, found three or four of our uh, uh, most fundamental security treaties abrogated without any uh, uh, congressional participation, I, for one, would, would feel that that was way beyond the uh, discretion of the president. But certain uh, presidents have abrogated treaties from time to time, uh, either because they found that the other party had already abrogated and breached the treaty, and therefore the treaty was in a condition of breach, which seems to me a permissible part of the president's power in, in conducting foreign relations, or as in the Taiwan case, as part of the uh, recognition, active recognition, uh, of communist China, the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and communist China, which President Carter did, and as an incident to that abrogation, uh, he uh, exercised the, the withdrawal clause of the security treaty with Taiwan. Now that is co constitutionally a defensible position because the president has an absolute monopoly from the beginning of, of the question of recognition. And in, the, in 1933, when President Roosevelt established diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, a great many agreements uh, were made on the side in connection with that uh, establishment of diplomatic relations, and the Supreme Court said that they were indeed part of the supreme law of the land. Some of those opinions have been criticized, but there they are. Well, it was a perfect, uh, is this on? I, can you hear me? It was a perfect illustration where uh, a president does uh, operate in, on his own in foreign policy because he concluded, as I understand it, and his advisors, that it was uh, more advantageous to the world uh, politic and to our country to uh, uh, have uh, relations with uh, mainland China than it was to continue the treaty with Taiwan. I don't necessarily feel that those were, uh, uh, those were uh, uh, positions that uh, uh, both of which had to uh, be fulfilled. I think we could have maintained our relationship with Taiwan and still created good re relations with, uh, with mainland China. Uh, with regard to the ABM Treaty, uh, I think Judge Sofair makes an eloquent case that uh, Sam Nunn is wrong. And again, I think the President makes an eloquent case that Sam Nunn is wrong because uh, after watching the Russians violate the ABM Treaty for year after year after year and now argue for the most strict of interpretations, it seems uh, incongruous to me that uh, Senator Nunn puts us into a debatable posture where literally we can debate between their very strict interpretation now and his own strict interpretation. You're looking at the Senator who after we had recognized mainland China and then we had that lull and that uh, decrease in good feelings between our country and China, who the week after, after uh, Senator Scoop Jackson went to China and of course they signaled that they were ready to resume better relations with us, they met with me the following week as the Republican counterpart to, to uh, Scoop Jackson and uh, treated us uh, royally, royally when we went over there, both uh, Senator Jackson and Senator Z uh, Zerinsky and myself, who were there at that particular time. But uh, you're also looking at the senator who amended uh, Carter's Taiwan Relations Act against the president's will. He fought the amendment to provide an element of protection or elements of protection for uh, the uh, Republic of China. So uh, again, another instance where Congress had to pretty well politically adapt itself to the president's will in foreign policy, but didn't do it completely because we put some bones in there for our long-standing relationship with the Republic of China.
uh, which irritated the mainland Chinese to death, and I think also showed that we didn't have to have the Taiwan Relations Act to begin with, had the president stood up and said, we want good relations with mainland China, but we have a long-term relationship here, and we will accept ambassadors from both, I think uh, they would have gone along with it in time. Excuse me, ju just a second. Uh, Professor Tiger would like to, uh, to ask just something. To comment on that. It <clears throat> seems to me that, that it's hard to get over the fact that the Constitution does divide the treaty-making process between the Senate and the president. And what's being argued here is that the Senate uh, agreed to the text of a treaty and yet apparently uh, was not aware of the meaning that's now being ascribed to it. Uh, such an argument that, that, that that's legitimate has to rest either on an interpretation of the text of the Constitution that I really don't see here, or on Senator Hatch's view that somehow the President is more competent to do this. I would remind the Senator that while the Boland amendments were going on, across town at 1600 Pennsylvania, the North Poindexter show was being played out, which was hardly a model of consistency in the executive branch. It was a lot more I consistent than the other side, I'll tell I you might, that. Uh, I didn't answer your... <laughs> I didn't, answer the, I didn't answer your question about uh, the application of the Taiwan uh, example to the controversy over the ABM Treaty. I think it cannot be advanced seriously that the interpretation of a treaty, which is an international instrument and a contract between countries, uh, is uh, de de decisively determined by what was said or not said in the murky debates on an obscure side issue in 1972 on the ratification of the ABM Treaty. I think uh, in this case, uh, Judge Sofair is entirely correct. The interpretation of treaties is the subject of uh, vast volumes and huge literature, and uh, it is like the interpretation of contracts, <coughs> a matter of what the parties decided. And if the ratification process is perfunctory, it is still nonetheless a treaty, and uh, the treaty has to be interpreted in accordance with the normal rules. And these rules are uh, that uh, what the parties meant, uh, as later people interpret them, uh, should govern. The president, in the first instance, is surely the person to govern. Congress can al always overrule that by passing a stat that interpretation, by passing a statute inconsistent uh, with the president's interpretation. And according to our law, the later statute uh, prevail, the later a statement of, uh, of a legislative will prevails. In this particular case, there really isn't any doubt. Uh, the Russians wouldn't uh, agree about future technologies, and they said very plainly, and I've talked to the, uh, the participants in the negotiations, that over and over again they said, we can't make uh, a treaty about future technologies. You don't know what they're going to do, and we don't know what they're going to do. So let's agree to leave them out, and that's what they thought they were doing in Agreed Statement D. The other interpretation is a perfectly plausible legal theory, except that it, does, it doesn't correspond to the facts of the negotiation, and it doesn't explain why Agreed Statement D is there at all. All right, let's move to the <clears throat> front microphone, sir. Yes. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. In light, this is for the whole panel, in light of the President's responsibility to faithfully execute the laws, what is the proper and responsible way for the President to initiate a challenge to the War Powers Act or any act that he feels is unconstitutional? What is the responsible and creative way for the President to undertake that? Perhaps Mr. General Cooper would be the... I'd also like to hear from Senator Hatch. Too. Yeah, respond initially. <laughs> well, the... I take it... Is this on? Hello? Uh, the... Uh, uh, restrictions on justiciability make that a very difficult question. The President can't just, in an abstract way, file a lawsuit uh, against Congress to uh, determine his rights under the War Powers uh, Resolution. Obviously, on the other hand, he cannot, uh, he, he, he cannot fail to perform his constitutional obligations to the American people as the uh, Chief Executive and the Commander-in-Chief and the chief organ of our foreign relations with, uh, with foreign countries. So it's, it's really a, a very, very difficult a position for any president to be in. That's anytime, why I asked the question. anytime. <laughs> oh, we thought it was a good question. 
<laughs> anytime there is a uh, is is a statute on the books that usurps uh, the president's authorities, uh, he, he simply cannot be bound by it. Well, uh, let me save the uh, attorney general uh, from um, barratry and maintenance. Uh, he can't admit to engaging in any such practices. And uh, of course, you could organize a test suit, which has been going on ever since the beginning of time. And the president should not make the mistake that Andrew Johnson made in testing the constitutionality of the Tenure of Office Act, which was the basis of his impeachment. That was a terrible mistake, poor fellow. But luckily, he prevailed. And it was <laughs> uh, so that the president has to disobey the act in order to pre present a justiciable case, or he can follow the strange uh, reasoning of uh, the Sierra case or Board of Education against Allen. And since the Supreme Court was so sympathetic to the law students who brought uh, the Sierra litigation, I suggested some of you go out and and start a little litigation uh, on that subject. There is a bill, a suit pending. Uh, brought by a hundred uh, members of Congress and one senator, I think. But uh, that's a passive response where he has to defend. I'm talking about the Well, he doesn't have to defend the constitutionality well, that in that su case. That subjects him to the possibility of the Tenure and Office Act and the impeachment if it, the political tensions well, get. No, no, he suggests. I suggest barratry and maintenance, rises. that's all. Oh. So he senator they, Hatch? If I could add something here. <clears throat> I think it's a political problem for the president, and I don't think anybody would fail to recognize that. He knows that if the climate is not right in this country for, uh, uh, for his refusal to comply with the War Powers Act, that uh, he's going to pay a heavy political price for it and cost. Uh, he also knows that uh, generally, uh, especially in later years, uh, since the Vietnam War, it is very difficult to get involved in any form of conflict without having whole segments of our society up in arms over it. So about the only way it seems to me practically that he can test it is to refuse to comply with it. Now, the president is basically refusing to comply with it in, in the uh, Persian Gulf matter now, but Congress hasn't really tested him that much on it. Uh, I suspect that he would be uh, sued at that point uh, in a very important test case, and I'm not sure that the Supreme Court's going to resolve it in the end. I, th I think, uh, if, if I could add just one a final note, I, I don't think it's accurate to say the President has not complied with War Powers Resolution with respect to Persian Gulf uh, uh, matters. In, 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 every, in every incident that might even arguably have required a, a report, a report uh, satisfying those requirements has been filed. But by the same token, he, he obviously is, is uh, continuing to pursue a policy that he believes as, uh, in, in his capacity as the uh, as the chief executive, commander in chief, and uh, principal organ for foreign relations in this country, is in the best interests of the American people. Now, I want to know what happens when the 60 days expire. Uh, well, even though you filed all the papers, what's going to happen? Well, there? the reason I ask the question is I'm so, sort of inviting the uh, Congress and, and uh, all of us as uh, um, scholars or lawyers to, to be open to the possibility of creating some sort of. Um, injunctive relief or having, having legislation that will be able well, to test this, but the president initiate some sort of uh, affirmative move so he's not caught in this tension where well, he's... Uh, there, there's a, there's another problem with, with what uh, we're suggesting here, and that, and that is... Because I think ignoring the law is, is, is not... Is not well, a, could I make a not, suggestion about this? Uh, General Cooper, I know, is in a difficult position. He's like the old boy. So I don't know what I think about that issue. I haven't been retained yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> But while I, I, I am, I am fully retained. I think, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think that no one on this panel uh, believes that the president acts in a rule-free way, right? That is to say, we're all talking about how you enforce the rules. Now, why I, while I yield to no one in my belief that the courts have the power to resolve disputes that in, involve private and even public rights. I'd like to suggest something else that comes out of 20 years of being a trial lawyer. And that is that Senator Hatch is talking about a process. If this, if the President and the Congress get to fussing with each other about it, you know, they could settle it short of litigating about it. There really isn't anything wrong with that. And the constitutional system, it seems to me, uh, ought, ought to provide for that. And indeed, it is a preferred way in the law life of the nation as it is in the private relations of individuals. However, 
a preemptive suit of the kind you're talking about obviously raises all of the justiciability difficulties trumped or doubled because the event hasn't happened yet. The particular way in which the president regards his conduct as unreasonably restrained hasn't been spelled out by what he did. And so maybe you're just back to Marbury versus Madison, right? I mean, that was the answer. Judge Marbury went up there and said, you know, Adams told me I could be a judge and the son of a gun won't give me my commission. And Chief Justice Marshall, while he said the statute was unconstitutional, also went out of his way to tell Tom Jefferson that uh, he ought to have shaped up. Um, I think that's the original intent answer to your question. Okay. Thank I, think, you. I think I'd add one word to it, that, that you can, I, what uh, Professor Tiger says is perfectly correct, of course, except that at the present moment we have an opportunity where there could be a live plaintiff who had a real case, namely the uh, mother or widow of some soldier who got or sailor who got killed. Couldn't be impossible mm. to find the executor of same. Oh, that, that all assumes that the political question doctrine does not apply to the to the questions that must be must be litigated and Martin and, uh, against Mott. <laughs> that, that case is suitably distinguished in the papers that we filed previously in the case that you earlier. I'm not sure I understand this, but I do have business cards for anybody. That <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the back microphone. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm John Regan. I'm here representing the uh, Villanova Law School chapter of the Federalist Society. I'd just like to uh, thank Senator Hatch for what I think were his very what? astute remarks concerning the constitutionality of the Boland Amendment. Uh, no offense intended to Professor Tiger at all, but uh, uh, I'd, I'd just like to ask the Senator if he feels that the views which he expressed are going to get a fair play in the uh, pending committee report, which is due out, I guess, any day now. Well, I've read uh, uh, most of the report uh, on both sides, the majority and the minority, at least the, <coughs> the, uh, the uh, major part of the report that uh, will be, I think, reviewed by the media. Uh, the majority does try to justify the Bowen Amendments. Uh, the minority, I think, rips them to shreds. And uh, you'll have to make up your own mind, <laughs> but I, I happen to have been a subscriber to the minority report. I felt like the majority report was uh, uh, biased in its approach. I think it misstated the facts. I think it distorted some of the facts. I think it was too political. And frankly, I think some of the conclusions they've drawn are, are not very good, while pretty well admitting that uh, there was no venality here, uh, perhaps, uh, and, and certainly no corruption. And, and there's a real question whether there was real criminal intent to violate these uh, civil statutes, uh, right. among other things. The last question goes to the front microphone. Senator Hatch, I'd like to say that from Vermont, I've been supportive of yours for about three or four years now for, well, for my time in college. Um, to start off with, I'd like to know if you could quickly comment. You mentioned that you were um, late here because of, of some incidences that were going on with uh, the judge and what's happening now. I was wondering if you're at liberty to release that. If you could tell us what's exactly going on now, I think this is incredibly ridiculous this is happening. And I'd really like to know if you could tell me what the other side could possibly be thinking about some reasonable excuse for why this is happening and so that I can better understand what's happening myself. Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, let me just say this. I've ch been chatting with the White House, with Judge Ginsburg, and with others. And uh, I don't know what has happened by now, but uh, by now, unless the White House has been willing to put support behind Judge Ginsburg, he probably has withdrawn. Now, if he withdraws, and I believe he probably has. I think that's a travesty. And I'll tell you why. Some, some of our people get all upset about the disclosure about marijuana. Well, I do too. I can't condone the use of marijuana cigarettes. And just in case any of you are worried, I've never tried one myself. <laughs> but nevertheless, there are two sides to the drug problem. One is to try and get young people and others to not participate in the use of drugs at all. The other is if they have made the mistake because of youth or for any other reason, uh, then if they pull away from them and repent and change their lives and live exemplary lives to understand that we forgive in this country and to understand that many people in this country, I think probably Almost everybody in this room may, may have something in his or her background that uh, you might be a little bit 
sorry that happened. I, even I. <laughs> In fact, go, especially go, go, go I. Go on with your statement, Senator. <laughs> Senator, what was that? What I'm trying to say is, is that I believe that the administration should back Judge Ginsburg fully and completely. I believe that my colleagues on the Democratic side of the floor will be more understanding, even as a result of this problem. I believe that the conservatives will be somewhat understanding, although some of them have distanced themselves a little bit because you naturally, as politicians, get maybe a little frightened by some of these things that happen. And I believe that we have a chance to get somebody on the court who will be there for 35 or 40 years, who is a supreme intellect, uh, a very fine human being, who has come this far, and I see most of the, uh, I see everything that's been, uh, of which he's been accused as being basically frivolous. And I see a White House that nominates these people and in my opinion, does not do everything it can to back them up. And the minute... <laughs> the minute a vicissitude comes, they run around like chickens with their heads cut off, thinking this is the first time anybody's ever been accused of anything in this administration. And I think that history tells us that ain't too accurate. And I believe I believe that, yes, people make mistakes, but I also believe the American people forgive those mistakes when those people turn out to be awfully good people like Judge Ginsburg is. And uh, I think it's pathetic what's happening, and if he has withdrawn, now I'm only giving you part of it, I'm not giving you all the inner secrets that I know right now, but if he has withdrawn, I for one am going to be damn mad about it. And I have to tell you, I'm going to be damn mad at the White House about it. And I don't think that I'm unjustified in feeling this way. And frankly, uh, uh, I think you can find fault with everybody. This society, uh, maybe it comes down to one other comment. One of the top pollsters in this country indicated to me that the only real issue in this presidential e election is an issue of integrity. It's an issue of decency. Because the people out there are concerned about decency in government. And I believe, that, uh, I believe that that is a very paramount issue in the eyes of many people. And I believe when a person has lived a decent life for uh, basically a decade, uh, after having had over a 12-year period maybe six marijuana cigarettes, that we ought to consider the quality of the person today and not worry so much about some of the vicissitudes of the past which have been repented of. And I think that's the way good people operate. That's the way this country has always operated. And I think for this administration to run and f hide for cover because they've had a few vicissitudes, I, I think it shows a lack of guts, to be honest with you, and it bothers me a great deal.